something outran the stars over Mars. October 2025. As Perseverance's night sky cameras capture a startling 60 km per second flash, matching the speed and timing of Interstellar Visitor 3, I slash Atlas's historic Mars flyby, scheduled Mars orbiters go dark and the raw images vanish into silence. Then, unconfirmed reports of multiple fast objects and a mysterious green flash set the scientific world on edge. The first Mars flyby images hinted at something odd, behavior no known comet should show, and official data releases stalled just when answers mattered most. What happened in those missing frames, and could these clues rewrite what we know about interstellar visitors? October 2, 2025. Stefan Burns, a well-known figure in the world of amateur astronomy, posts a nine-minute night sky time-lapse from Perseverance's raw image archive. The sequence, stitched together from a run of consecutive frames, displays a single, razor-thin streak that cuts across the Martian starscape. The apparent velocity, 60 km per second, stands out immediately, far exceeding any known meteor, satellite, or cosmic ray artifact typically seen in Mars rover data. For comparison, NASA's Parker Solar Probe, the fastest human-made object, reaches 192 km per second only at perihelion deep in the Sun's gravity well. Here, the streak holds a steady pace at Mars's distance, where such speeds are reserved for interstellar wanderers. Burns's methodology is methodical. He overlays the raw frames against a fixed star catalogue, calibrates the plate scale using known star separations, and checks each timestamp for consistency. The streak's motion is measured relative to background stars, frame by frame, ruling out any fixed camera artifact or cosmic ray hit. Debugging frame dropouts and cross-checking with public star charts, he publishes the full stack and invites the community to replicate the finding or break it apart. The result is a viral surge. Tens of thousands download the frames, rerun the stacking, and debate whether the streak is real, an artifact, or something stranger. Burns's reputation for technical rigor and skepticism adds weight to his disclosure. He's quick to point out the need for external replication, urging others not to leap to extraordinary conclusions before the streak's origin is independently confirmed. The calculation is clear. If the measured 60 km per second holds up, the track matches the predicted sky motion of 3i slash Atlas, almost exactly. But the burden now shifts outward. The amateur community seizes the challenge. Can anyone else reproduce the anomaly, or will it dissolve under closer scrutiny? Online forums light up as soon as Burns' time-lapse goes public. Within hours, hundreds of independent analysts download the Perseverance frames, eager to reproduce or dismantle the 60 km per second streak. The debate quickly fragments. Some report success, stacking the frames with custom scripts they claim to spot not just the main track, but hints of secondary fast movers in the October 3rd data. Others, running alternative pipelines, see nothing but noise. Accusations of overfitting and artifact hunting fly back and forth. At 0003 UTC, a brief green flash appears in one group's animation. The pixel-level anomaly triggers a cascade of speculation. Is it a real emission event, or just a cosmic ray strike amplified by aggressive stacking? Rival teams dissect the color channels, arguing over calibration and filter settings. Some insist the green flash is chemically plausible, a cometary emission line, perhaps. Detractors counter that Mars's thin atmosphere and the camera's sensor quirks make such flashes more likely to be digital ghosts than real phenomena. The lack of raw, unprocessed images only deepens the uncertainty. Without access to original FITS files and camera telemetry, every claim is provisional. Statistical tests for signal-to-noise ratio, frame-to-frame -frame consistency, and cosmic ray rejection become battlegrounds. The absence of official data release, no rapid pipeline dump, no calibration scripts, fuels suspicion. Is this just the normal lag of moving target campaigns, or something more deliberate? The community's frustration grows. Some demand institutional arbitration, pushing for NASA or ESA to weigh in and settle the technical disputes. Others double down on open source analysis, posting code and intermediate stacks in hopes of crowdsourced validation. The signal's reality hangs in limbo. 
its fate now tied to whether the upcoming Mars Orbiter campaigns will deliver decisive, independently verifiable images. Mars, for a brief window in early October, became the solar system's best vantage point on an interstellar visitor. Three orbiters, MRO with high-rise, ESA's Trace Gas Orbiter carrying KSSIS, and Mars Express with HRSC were all tasked to catch 3I-ATLAS as it swept past at approximately 29 million kilometers. That's about 75 times the distance from Earth to the Moon, a gulf so vast that even the sharpest camera on Mars, high-rise, would see the object as little more than a smudge. Its best-case resolution stretched to dozens of kilometers per pixel. High-rise, designed to spot boulders on Martian slopes, had never been aimed at a target moving this quickly or this far. Its imaging sequences were reprogrammed for the flyby, using updated ephemeris data to point the narrow field of view ahead of the predicted path. Each exposure was a calculated gamble. Aim too early and the object would be out of frame, too late, and it would vanish into the background stars. CAS-IS, built for color imaging and jet analysis, prepared a series of four band exposures, hoping to catch not just the nucleus, but any fragments or jets trailing behind. Mars Express's HRSC, with its wide swath and multiband coverage, was assigned to scan for coarse structure. Could it distinguish a single nucleus from a cluster or spot a sunward jet against the glare? The campaign required meticulous coordination. Each orbiter's observation plan depended on precise predictions from JPL horizons, updated daily, as 3i slash Atlas's trajectory refined. The spacecraft themselves had to slew off their usual nadir pointings, sometimes by several degrees, to track a moving speck against the deep sky. Onboard limitations meant there was no real-time tracking. Each image was a snapshot, banking on the accuracy of last-minute calculations. For objects at interplanetary distances, even a minor error in the ephemeris could mean a total miss. As the flyby approached, instrument teams juggled competing priorities, maximizing exposure time, minimizing cosmic ray contamination, and squeezing precious bandwidth for rapid downlink. Every frame would be scrutinized for hints of structure. Was 3i slash ATLAS a single solid body, a loose cluster of fragments, or something stranger? At this range, only features tens of kilometers across could be resolved. Color bands, if captured, might reveal chemical fingerprints, broad green, blue, or red streaks hinting at exotic composition. The stakes were high. With Earth-based telescopes blinded by solar glare, Mars's orbiters held the only clear window. The expectation was simple. If anything odd happened, fragmentation, jets, companions, these images would be the first to show it. The entire campaign was a race against geometry, motion, and time. No raw images. That's the phrase echoing across every discussion as the days tick by after the Mars flyby. Normally, Mars orbiter data, especially from headline events, hits public archives within a few days of downlink, at least in uncalibrated form. This time, nothing. Not from high-rise, not from Cassis, not even the routine quick-look frames from Mars Express. The silence is absolute, broken only by terse status updates hinting at ongoing calibration and quality assurance. Inside JPL, the imaging teams face a different kind of pressure. The challenge isn't just about bandwidth or bureaucratic delay. It's about the risk of releasing frames riddled with cosmic ray hits, uncorrected hot pixels, or misaligned stacks that could be mistaken for real fragments or jets. For a moving target like 3i slash Atlas, sweeping across the sky at 60 km per second, standard pipelines break down. Flat fielding, geometric correction, and radiometric calibration all have to be reworked. Even the best cosmic ray rejection filters, tuned for slow-moving Martian landscapes, struggle to separate a genuine interstellar streak from a stray charged particle. JPL's imaging lead, speaking under the weight of public scrutiny, describes the process as a race against both error and expectation. Every frame must be checked for registration drift. Did the predicted ephemeris line up with the actual sky? Did a cosmic ray or solar particle leave a one-off streak that could be misread as a companion object? For this campaign, even the act of stacking images, a routine step, 
becomes a minefield. Misalign by a fraction and artifacts multiply. Stack too aggressively and faint real features could vanish. The stakes are clear, release too soon and a digital ghost could ignite a global frenzy. Wait too long and accusations of cover-up multiply. The calibration team moves frame by frame, cross-referencing predicted target motion against actual pixel trails, flagging anomalies for manual review. Every candidate fragment, every odd flash, gets logged, debated, and either cleared or escalated. No one at JPL claims the delay is satisfying. The reality is a bottleneck of caution, one that puts scientific integrity above speed, even as the world waits. The next release will have to answer more than just curiosity. It must settle, with evidence, whether Mars's cameras caught a single nucleus, a cluster of fragments, or something that demands a new kind of explanation. A comet's green glow seen from millions of kilometers away is usually an open and shut case. Dicarbon, or C2, emits a bright green signature when sunlight breaks its molecular bonds, a process so reliable that comet hunters use it as a chemical calling card. In the case of 3i slash Atlas, the story gets tangled. Reports from the Mars flyby window claim a fleeting green flash, captured at 00,03 UTC in some of the Perseverance frame stacks. The implication is simple. If the flash is real, it should mean dicarbon is present and active in the coma. But early provisional spectra from Mars Express and TGO hint at the opposite. The expected C2 emission bands are weak or even missing, replaced by a volatile mix rich in carbon dioxide and depleted in classic carbon chains. In lab terms, a green flash without dicarbon is a contradiction. Standard cometary physics has no easy answer for a spectrum that glows green but lacks the swan bands at 516 and 563 nanometers. If the color is genuine, it demands a new mechanism or a new contaminant at work. Spectroscopists trained to chase down false positives urge caution. Without calibrated, time-locked spectra tied to the exact moment of the reported flash, the chemical paradox remains untested. Was the green a real emission event or a digital artifact from stacking and color correction? Until the raw Mars orbiter data drops, the only way to resolve the contradiction is with direct, instrument-verified spectra. The next round of releases will need to show, pixel by pixel, whether 3i slash Atlas's chemistry can actually break the rules. Spectral data from the Mars campaign lands like a challenge to textbook comet science. Early reports from the Mars Express team highlight an emission fingerprint dominated by nickel, not iron, a reversal of what solar system comets display. Nickel lines, usually faint or drowned out by iron, now tower over the spectrum. Planetary chemists combing through the ratios note that nothing in the standard formation models predicts this order of abundance. The anomaly doesn't end with metals. Trace gas orbiters instruments log a volatile mix where carbon dioxide outgassing dwarfs water vapor by an order of magnitude. For a comet heating up near the sun, water is supposed to lead. Here, carbon dioxide is king, with water nearly absent. Jet geometry throws another curve. Mars orbiter images, even at their core scale, show a plume not trailing away from the sun but blasting forward an anti-tail, sunward, and sharply defined. This jet falls off so steeply that dust models struggle to fit it. The classic broad fan-shaped tail is missing. Instead, the plume's leading edge is crispy, the brightness gradient unnaturally steep. Teams running dynamic simulations estimate that only a very large, very dense nucleus could sustain such a plume without being spun apart or blown off course. Tracking teams calculate the object's mass by watching for any non-gravitational acceleration, tiny nudges from jets or uneven outgassing. For 3 Sun I slash Atlas, the answer is silence. Even with visible activity, its path hugs the predicted gravitational arc almost perfectly. The implied lower bound, 10 billion tons, more asteroid than comet. Each oddity is logged, debated, and stacked into a growing dossier. Natural models are stretched to explain the chemistry, the dynamics, the sheer mass. The stakes climb as the scientific community weighs whether these signatures point to an object that simply rewrites the comet rulebook, 
or something that can't be written off as natural at all. Avi Loeb, known for pushing the boundaries of interstellar research, enters the debate with a provocative calculation. His team runs orbital models, backtracing the path of 3i slash Atlas across decades to see if it might overlap with the famous 1977 WOW signal, the 72-second radio burst at 1420 megahertz, the hydrogen line. Using JPL horizons and Monte Carlo simulations, they estimate the chance of such a sky position coincidence at about 0.6%. That's rare, but not impossible. The hydrogen line holds special weight in SETI circles. It's the frequency most likely to be used for interstellar signaling. Loeb's group argues that if any object deserved a targeted radio follow-up, it's one that passes through the WOW coordinates and moves at interstellar speed. SETI researchers, cautious as ever, point out the pitfalls, positional uncertainty, the vastness of the sky, and the risk of post hoc reasoning. Still, the specificity of a narrowband hydrogen line signal remains the gold standard for artificiality. Nature doesn't broadcast in such a tight channel. With 3 by slash Atlas now behind the sun, the question lingers. Will the next radio window reveal anything more than silence? After October 29th, 3i slash Atlas slips behind the sun, entering a blackout zone that blinds both Earth and Mars-based observers. For the next five weeks, no telescope can track its position, brightness, or evolving structure. This is not an unusual gap. Perihelion always brings a forced pause, dictated by the sun's glare and the hard limits of spacecraft safety protocols. Throughout November, planetary scientists, amateur astronomers, and techno-signature advocates all watch the calendar, waiting for early December when the object will finally reappear in the pre-dawn sky. Four key metrics dominate the watch list. Overall brightness, trajectory against background stars, tail or jet morphology, and spectral fingerprints. Each will be scrutinized for changes. Has the object fragmented, faded, or shifted course? The next window is brief, but decisive. Verification will depend on what emerges from that solar shadow and whether the data matches predictions or deepens the mystery. Sorting signal from noise begins with a simple ladder. At the base, repeatability. Genuine features, whether streaks, flashes, or companions, must appear in independent stacks with timestamps and ephemeris matching across teams. Artifacts, by contrast, vanish when pipelines shift or calibration changes. Next, multiband confirmation. A real object should register in more than one filter or wavelength, with color ratios that make physical sense. Artifacts often flicker in a single channel or flip color under different processing. Above that, geometric and dynamic hallmarks. True companions should move in parallel, trackable against predicted paths, and maintain consistent separation, never jumping or blurring with stack order. The top rung, maneuver, or structure. Deliberate motion, narrowband radio, or repeating geometry. These are nearly impossible for nature to fake. Each claim climbs this ladder, facing harder tests at every step. The burden of proof rises with the claim. The scorecard is open. Mark every anomaly, demand receipts, and let the evidence speak. Chemically, three. I slash Atlas challenges comet models. Its nickel-to-iron ratio, carbon dioxide-heavy composition, and massive sunward plume all stand out. Yet the most critical evidence remains out of public view. The object's projected path overlaps the 1977 WOW signal location with a calculated 0.6% probability, but no independent radio detections have yet emerged. As 3i slash Atlas approaches perihelion and a blackout in observations, the facts demand patience and rigor. Until the next data release, the mystery stands. We have an interstellar puzzle, a stack of anomalies, and no confirmed answers, only the evidence and what we do with it next.